I'm Kirk Boone, I'm an author and photographer, and here I'm with uh, T.K. Mills, editor-in-chief of Up Magazine. We're here in the community gallery at uh, Journal Square Station, and we're going to talk about uh, the global street art movement and ask uh, T.K. to give us some, some insights, yeah. right? Thank so, you start off pretty easy, uh, T.K., uh, where where'd you grow up? Uh, so I grew up in Peekskill, New York. It's uh, upstate uh, along the Hudson River. Uh, and then I lived there until I was 18, and then I left for college. I went to school out in Boulder, Colorado, uh, where I got my mass, or I got my undergrad in um, political science and international affairs. And then I took a year where I was backpacking Southeast Asia and working as an English teacher for a bit. And then I came to New York City about 2015-ish. Uh, where I got my master's in transnational security, and then my life took a different turn and started writing about art. Okay, great, great. So, uh, how did you run into street art? How did you get into it? Yeah, so uh, while I was doing my master's, I originally was planning to go work for the State Department, uh, and I was kind of turned off by a lot of the toxic elements of contemporary politics. Um, and so, very beginning of 2017, January 2017, um, I decided to take a, a trip to Cuba. I was there backpacking for like six weeks. Uh, and while I was down there, I was kind of, you know, trying to rethink what I wanted to do with my life. Um, you know, and I came to the conclusion that I wanted to be a writer. Um, so I was like, you know, well, if I'm going to be a writer, I should write something while I'm down here. And um, I ended up doing a story on this <laughs> Cuban graffiti artist. Uh, so he goes, his name's Fabian, um, and he, uh, his art is he does, um, basically these characters with a balaclava, and he always writes this, uh, phrase, two plus two equals five, uh, and I saw the phrase two plus two equals five, and my mind went to George Orwell's 1984, uh, which at the time seemed particularly relevant, uh, managed to track him down and did an, uh, interview with him. Um, and I ended up getting it published in this uh, London magazine. Um, and that was really encouraging for me as a writer to have something, you know, my first article published. So I was like, oh, well, I really enjoyed that. And then I, you know, finished my trip, came back to New York, and I lived in Bushwick at the time, uh, really just because it was cheap. Mm -hmm. And then, um, you know, I was looking around. Bushwick's got a lot of street art, a lot of graffiti. And I was like, well, I liked writing about that in Cuba. Let me kind of see what's going on here. And so from there, I basically just started going to art shows and started getting into the scene. It was uh, freelancing on top of bartending and waitering and, you know, all those different side jobs, and uh, it, it took off. No, that's, that's great. Uh, so what, what is Up Magazine, and why did you start it? So Up Magazine is a street art and graffiti magazine uh, that is printed physically as well as uh, an online website where we publish twice a week. Um, and then the print comes out once or twice a year, depending on uh, how well we keep to our schedules. Um, and so the reason I started it uh, was because I was freelancing for a couple of years. Um, and I found myself frustrated at times because as a writer, you don't have a lot of power over um, what you write. It's really what your editor dictates. Uh, and a lot of the art magazines at the time um, didn't really appreciate street art. It was all fine art. And every time I was pitching the street art articles, uh, they weren't really having it. Um, and so, you know, I, I was kind of looking for new avenues to sort of express myself and kind of cover what I wanted to cover. Um, and one magazine I was writing for uh, had sent me out to California to do a couple um, interviews. I interviewed Teacher. Dirk Cobain, Thrashbird, and uh, Padilla, Unfuck Yourself, all big LA street artists. Uh, and I did the articles. Um, and then after I submitted them, the magazine was kind of like, we're going in a different direction. And uh, I don't know if we're going to be able to publish it. And I was really frustrated because I was kind of like, um, you know, I had spent all this time. I felt mm -hmm. I owed it to the artist to get it out there. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I was kind of complaining to a mentor of mine. And my mentor was like, well, why don't you start your own magazine? And uh, at first, my response was, I don't know. It sounds like a lot of work. And uh, it has been. But that was kind of where the idea started. So fall 2018, I gathered um, 
one, uh, the only other writer I knew, Victoria Benzine, who wrote about street art, and then she connected me with her friend Christina Alia, and then Lonnie Richards, aka Mr. Candid, was our initial photographer, and so the first edition of Up was just the four of us. And so basically, from the end of 2018 to like spring 2019, we would just meet like every day at my apartment, working on putting together all the content, getting everything together, and uh, we ended up releasing it in spring, uh, well actually I guess it was technically summer, June 20th, 2019. Uh, we printed 250 copies of the first issue and uh, it ended up selling out, okay. which was uh, really exciting and kind of unexpected. And so um, with that, it kind of gave us a lot of sort of confidence that there was like something to it. And so, uh, yeah. So what, was, so what was in that first issue? Who were, who were some of the artists so, you yeah. featured? So with Up, each of our print issues is uh, themed. The first issue with the theme was money. And we decided to start with money because of the fact that it's always relevant. You know, there's the starving artist trope and the relationship between art and money is always a complex one. So we decided to kind of investigate that. And we were recruiting uh, artists that we felt kind of represented that money idea. So one of our... Um, Initial headline artist was uh, Sean Sullivan, Layer Cake. He's a very talented artist and uh, something of a strong personality. Um, Where's he based out of? Uh, he's from the Bronx. Well, he's from the Bronx in the Upper West Side, um, but he's based out of New York. He's New York, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, most of our initial, most of the artists in the first issue were New York based, just because at the time we didn't really have the capacity to do too much more. Uh, but in the time that we've grown, we've now got articles from all over the world. Um, but, uh, but yeah, another artist that we ended up uh, working with in our first issue, since we're in Jersey, I'll give a shout out, was uh, Orange Lee. Mm -hmm. uh, she actually works with uh, Mana. Uh, okay. Or at least she did. I, I don't know if she still does. Mm -hmm. um, and um, our cover artist for the first issue was Fumero. And he, had, uh, he has a very unique style called uh, Graphstrack, which is basically his own interpretation of graffiti and abstract art, and he did a rendition of uh, the Wall Street Bull, which we felt was kind of very fitting for the idea of, um, you know, the money issue, yeah. Yeah, no, nah, no, nah, that's, that's, that's cool. So I have the second issue in my hand, mm -hmm. and you, you mentioned, you know, that, you know, globally, this street art is everywhere, right? Oh, totally. So, so reaching that audience could be quite difficult, even yes. though it's there, Reaching it could, is another challenge, but I see uh, in this issue you, you have travel in place mm -hmm. and you have some correspondence, right? One from London, Tokyo, I see Brazil, Chicago. What, what was that like putting this, this issue together? So truthfully, our second issue, uh, Travel in Place, uh, came together sort of organically after the June 2019 release of the first one. We worked tirelessly to get the second one out. We ended up releasing it in November 2019. Uh, but for that one was uh, a lot of growing pains. It was sort of a Pyrrhic victory, so to speak. Um, we got a lot of our writers sort of through a mix of word of mouth and uh, reaching out. For example, one of the writers, Gabriel, who uh, covered Brazil in that uh, article or in that issue, um, we met him through our designer, who also happens to be Brazilian and also is from Porto Alegre. And, uh, you know, one of our other writers, um, Naomi from Tokyo, I had actually met her uh, on a Tinder date um, when she had come to New York. And then she also happened to, she works on a wedding magazine out in uh, Japan. Mm. Um, and so she had a couple friends in the graffiti scene out there. We really wanted to have Jap uh, Japan represented just because it's, not a part of the world that often people think of when they think of graffiti. Mm -hmm. um, and then we also tried to just get all over the US. Uh, we have Chicago, we have LA, uh, obviously New York, right. uh, Miami. Um, we also tried to, with the travel in place issue, look at how street art uh, works in relation to its environment. Um, we have an article on gentrification in there, kind of talking about the sort of mixed bag of, you know, street art is often sort of one of the first signs of gentrification in a neighborhood and how it's sort of a blessing and a curse at times because it helps provide opportunity, but also at the same time as neighborhoods grow, a lot of people who've lived there get priced out. Um, 
So yeah, with Travel in Place, we, we really tried to look at you know, that theme of trying to cover the truly global aspect of street art uh, and how in different cities, different scenes, how that relationship develops. No, no, it's great. It's a great issue. And in issue three, you, you worked on community and culture, yes, which is which was quite quite interesting. And um, you, I, I really did like the piece on uh, the ex vandals. Oh yeah, right? yeah, gotta give you a know, shout out to yeah, them. Yeah, yeah. And so, to talk a little bit about the, the community issue and, and and how that came together. Was that pretty easy to put together since you already did two, or you had to work? Well, so funny enough, uh, issue three was originally scheduled for uh, March 2020. Um, as we all know, March 2020 did not go as anyone <laughs> expected. Um, so we, we had a lot of setbacks because right as we were about to finish the issue, we kind of hit this uh, wall with COVID where a lot of our writers, um, you know, uh, most of our team is, uh, you know, freelance. A lot of them worked in restaurants um, or different sort of day jobs. And with COVID, most of them had to leave. So we were kind of had to sort of re-recruit a lot of people um, to kind of build out the issue. Um, you know, with the content itself, we knew what we wanted to do because community is a very strong central value of street art. Uh, and so we wanted to kind of give back to that, especially in light of COVID. Mm -hmm. um, the cover artist for issue three is uh, Chris Robots Will Kill. Uh, I know it, it goes without saying for anyone who knows him, but he's known as one of the nicest guys in street art, and it's true. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, with the, the issue three cover, uh, we, it was sort of bittersweet. So all of the names on the robot are people that are either in the issue or were, you know, had a good relationship with Chris, and he wanted to kind of shout them out. And all of the names in the background are actually artists who have passed away. Uh, and it got a little morbid at one point because Chris and I were going back and forth uh, with COVID. We had to keep updating it for different people who had passed away. Um, but Phase two passed away during that period, yeah, too. Yeah. yeah. And so uh, we, we wanted to give a, a shout out, really kind of trying to represent the community of that. No, that's, 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 that's beautiful. I mean, it's a great issue. So I, I kind of got introduced to street art through kind of like, politics, mm -hmm. which is this year. Yes, and that, so most recent. Yeah, 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 and so the political one, I mean, obviously some of my photos are featured in this, Yes. but I got involved with it through Black Lives Matter. Mm -hmm. So I had did a project for the Graffiti Hall of Fame, which was old school writing, right? Mm -hmm. But it wasn't a lot of political messages mm -hmm. involved in that, right? So when I got introduced to the, the street art as in the, the, the Baskies of the world, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying Baski was on the street, I'm just saying he's like a symbol oh, of totally. it, right, right, right? So, and I got interested in it just because it was it's Black Lives Matter, mm -hmm. right? And I put a catalog together called Fresh Plywood, mm -hmm. Artists Rise Up, and, and, and Black Lives Matter. And so, um, it was it was something I could gravitate to because there were messages in it. Yeah. And so, this is a uh, is amazing. The politics is really amazing because street art <coughs> is actually used mm -hmm. for that in all kinds of ways. Oh, totally. Yeah. Right from from letter writing to images, mm -hmm. things of that nature. So, how, what was it like putting the the political issue together? So the political issue uh, was hard. Um, for a variety of reasons. Uh, we had a lot of obstacles after finishing the community issue. Uh, I was kind of going through a lot of personal stuff myself. Um, you know, in terms of personal finances, it was just kind of figuring out how to build a company. And so that was a big thing after issue three is I had to sort of shift roles from just being sort of a writer editor to being sort of the editor in chief actually making it a business and, mm -hmm. and how we get that to, to go together. Um, and with the politics issue, we knew uh, what we wanted to do. It was funny, actually, um, the first five issues of Up, when we initially started it, I knew the fir first five themes. And we had knew we wanted to do a politics issue in 2020 um, just because of the fact that that was going to be a presidential election. Um, sorry. Phew! <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, and so, yeah, with the, uh, the politics issue, um, you know, a lot of the content and putting it together 
it was sort of evolving because, you know, with both COVID and the election and, you know, the murder of George Floyd, there was just a lot of moving pieces and we mm -hmm. were doing our best to kind of keep up with it. Um, but there was a, a lot of things that we learned kind of in putting together the politics issue. Um, one thing we wanted to do was to kind of build out the team more, like such as recruiting yourself. Yeah, yeah. Um, and we worked with a couple artists who have now become close friends. Okay. Such as uh, Constance Patton. Yeah, um, yeah. The leader of the Soho Renaissance Factory mm -hmm. uh, was one of our cover artists in that issue. Um, and so, yeah, with the politics issue, it was, we felt we needed to say something. You know, you, you can't just stand on the sidelines of everything going on. Um, and so, you know, UP has no official political standpoint. Um, this is something that, you know, per my own personal values, uh, I'm politically independent. And so, you know, uh, a lot of our coverage tends to lean progressive just because a lot of our writers tend to be more progressive. But um, funny enough, we did actually reach out to a couple uh, Trump artists. Um, and funny story, we had an interview lined up and this one guy was uh, talking a lot of shit. And uh, oh. and then after Trump lost, he ghosted us. And I was oh, like, ah, right. you, you're you're talking a big game when uh, you know you thought you were on top, <laughs> right. which to me was sort of indicative, I think, of a lot of the personalities that gravitate toward that. Um, but yeah, we we really try to cover a lot of different issues. Um, for example, one of the articles in the fourth issue talks about uh, border walls mm -hmm. and how those often become a focal point of both protests and art. Uh, such as the um, wall that separates Palestine and Israel. Uh, you know, Banksy really helped make that spot famous, but it's covered in street art and graffiti, a lot of which is sort of political in nature. Um, and that article also looks at the historical components, uh, such as the Berlin Wall, and how you know, that became sort of a means and a medium of expression uh, for you know, those living in East Germany at the time, um, and a way of kind of self-expression in a, you know, uh, an oppressive society. Yeah, that, that carries over to the statues here in the United States. Oh, totally, where, yeah. Where they were using uh, street, well, graffiti per se to, to, to paint the statues with, with, you know, the messages, right? Oh, totally, So yeah. it made the statues look really, really ugly. But it, it was for a reason, right? Yeah. Political reason. And so that, that was, and that helped mm -hmm. make people take the statues down. Because it was upsetting the people. Oh, totally, and, yeah. And people were voicing their opinion through graffiti, right? Well, and I think that was a big thing of the politics issue, was looking at how art is a means of expression, but it also is a means of protest. And, you know, with that, it can be a vehicle for change. <laughs> um, and so, you know, a lot of the artists that we worked with with that one um, tended to be very sort of politically minded. Again, we, we, we try and curate the, each issue uh, around the theme. We have the theme and then we build out the artist roster around that. Um, but we were very fortunate to work with a lot of incredibly talented artists for issue four, yeah. No, it was great. And how has uh, the public been reflecting on these four issues? Are, are sales picking up? Are you seeing interest in, in what you're writing about? Obviously, street art is popular, but is it, is it turning into dollars, per se, to run? The mm -hmm. magazine. So, uh, yes and no. Uh, so we sold out our first issue. Uh, initially, the second issue, we had sort of, again, those growing pains, but we did eventually sell out the second issue. And the third issue with uh, Chris Robots sold out very quickly. A lot of that, honestly, based on his popularity more than ours. Um, so the second issue sold out? Yeah, so the first three all sold out. Oh, the first three? Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so the fourth one... Uh, we have about 100 copies left of the 850 print run that we did. Uh, so we, we sell pretty well. Really, honestly, and our, our subscribers have continued to go up. Our website traffic has continued to go up. Up's Instagram following has continued to grow. So in that regard, it's all been very positive. Uh, in terms of the business side, though, uh, the reality is printing a print magazine is you know, stupid expensive. Um, and we try and subsidize the cost of it with basically sponsors and essentially advertisements in each issue. Um, we only started doing that with the third issue and then we've been doing it each one since. Um, but the reality is, is for a magazine that comes out essentially once a year, 
you know, the advertising revenue is not nearly enough to keep things running. So kind of on that business aspect, uh, one of the things I've learned is kind of utilizing our resources uh, to how we can kind of capitalize on, you know, we have a really strong creative team. How do we make this work in a business way? Mm -hmm. And so what we've done is we've basically established a couple different partnerships that uh, is where most of our income comes from. Uh, so, for example, one is uh, Sour Mouse. It's a bar in the Lower East Side that we've been working with for the past year and a half. Uh, we do art events with them monthly. Uh, we run the New York City Art League uh, in collaboration with Bree Chapin. Um, and we do, you know, kind of this tournament style art battles. Um, you were one of the judges yeah, for yeah, one. Yeah, that's right. Thank you. And so that's always a lot of fun. Uh, one of our other partners is actually another Jersey based company, uh, Mural Painter Inc. Uh, they're based out of Hoboken. Um, and so they do commercial murals. They work for a lot of big companies like Lionsgate and Microsoft and, you know, companies of that nature. Uh, and so a lot of these big companies, when they're looking to get sort of a commercial mural done, uh, they tend to go to Mural Painter. Um, and so for Mural Painter, what we do is a lot of their media. Uh, we do a lot of their photography and videography. Um, another of our partners is Third Rail. Uh, which is sort of an art fashion boutique mm -hmm. uh, where they do a couple different, you know, artist collaborations uh, and different art merchandise. And so with them, uh, I run the Third Rail blog uh, as well as helping out with the social media and a lot of other stuff with that. Uh, the creative director of Third Rail, uh, Luca Bambini, is a friend of mine who I've been working with uh, for many years. He actually... I uh, owe him a lot because during COVID, he was the only one throwing me work. Kind of was the only reason I was able to keep my head above water. Um, and then our last major partner at the moment is uh, Vettere Press, which is a company based out of uh, Indiana. Uh, and they do essentially um, coffee table books, focusing a lot on um, art and photography. And so what we do is we do all of their interior designs, and I work as a project manager, uh, helping to you know, basically keep all of their projects moving and flowing. All right, that's great. Now, have you all strategized since this is a, a global art movement, mm -hmm. you know, um, and this material is relevant oh, totally, all over yeah. the world. Have you all discussed like how to, in the next two to three years, do you want to find distributors in different countries or you want to get more investors to, you know, reach that audience that's say hungry? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, 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 and a print version. Yeah, so we do hope to kind of expand, particularly Europe has a really big scene that we've been looking to kind of break into. Uh, a lot of it's been hard, truthfully, with uh, COVID. You know, um, we had a couple contacts that, you know, we were trying to follow up with, but with everything going on, it was kind of hard to keep it going. We do have a distribution network um, based mostly here in the U.S., but we have um, a couple galleries we've been discussing deals with, uh, particularly in London, and it is something we're looking to kind of expand into. Um, but, you know, it's, it's one of those things um, I've come to learn, you got to walk before you run. Okay. And so kind of building things organically. Um, you know, one of my favorite stories to tell is uh, initially with Up, back in spring 2019, after we had finished all the content for the first issue, uh, we were having problems basically financing it. And so... Uh, we had gone to a couple different investor meetings and we kind of got the same response. Everyone loved it. They loved the idea. They loved the concept. But no one wanted to put money down uh, because they were like, well, how's a print magazine going to work? You know, there was a lot of doubts. Uh, and so the way we initially financed was um, when I was born, my parents bought me life insurance and over X amount of years it accrued a bit of value. And uh, at 18, they told me, you know, that's your money. You should leave it in investments. And when you're 60, it'll be worth actual money. Uh, but when I was starting up, I was like, well, we need some business capital. And so I cashed out my life insurance. It was worth uh, about $12,000 at the time, uh, which to me seemed like a great deal of money because it was the most money I'd ever had at any one point. Um, and I invested all of that into up. But for me, that was a big part of you know building up was I literally put my life on the line for it. And so, you know, I've continued to learn and adapt and kind of try and grow into my role as editor-in-chief um, just because of the fact that, you know, it's, it's a hard industry to, you know, work in um, just because it is an ongoing problem with a lot of artists. You know, how do you 
connect to that money aspect, you know, without, mm -hmm. you know, selling out your integrity. Because uh, for me, up, uh, a big part of it is sort of, you know, our own personal values and our own integrity behind it. Um, you know, where I, we were actually uh, offered a buyout after the second issue uh, for $100,000 that I turned down uh, because I still wanted to be able to have creative control over it. Um, and I stand by that decision. You know, as we continue to grow, I've definitely kind of thought about looking toward outside investment and ways we can kind of build on that. Um, but again, I'm one of those people that takes things one step at a time. You know, a lot of my focus at present is we are currently finishing up uh, issue five, uh, the theme of which is icons, and we're looking at probably a mid-May release. Um, and so after that comes out, I feel like five is sort of a landmark number, so I think I'm gonna take a little bit of time to do some you know, assessment of what the future is and where we're gonna go. But uh, you know, we've been growing. I mean, especially the past couple months, it's really exploded. Our website traffic has, uh, you know, every month we have more people than the last. Uh, we continue to get more and more subscribers even when, you know, there is sort of a delay between issues. So it's very encouraging. Uh, and we just kinda wanna keep growing with it. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm get into the multi facet areas of, of street art because mm -hmm. I, I think that's real important for the general public they don't really know the complexity of of this like art form oh, it's, totally, not, yeah. it's not it's not straightforward but you don't have to mention any names but any are there any competitors doing kind of like what you're doing so i mean i don't mind naming names like i a big thing that i've learned in paper i in, know it's a lot online yeah yeah, yeah. well i was gonna say um <laughs> It's funny because I feel like a big value of street art and graph is kind of give credit where credit's due, so I'll give credit where credit's due. All right. Uh, there is one other print street art magazine based out of France, Graffiti Art Magazine. They've been doing it about 20 or so years, I think. Oh. Um, and they seem to be doing well. I actually hope to one day kind of see if there's any way we can kind of cooperate because I own a couple issues myself and, you know, as someone who produces a print magazine, I have started a collection of print magazines. Oh, nice. Um, there's also Street and More, based out of, I think, the Netherlands. And actually, they were a big influence on Up initially. Um, you know, they really kind of, uh, they, I think they print quarterly. I'm not entirely sure. Um, but I really like their magazine. Uh, and those are kind of the two only other, you know, street art print magazines that I know of. There's a lot of online stuff. There's Brooklyn Street Art. Yeah, there yeah, is uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sold Magazine, who I actually used to write for for a bit. Um, but in terms of print, I'm pretty sure it's the street and more and graffiti art. But also they have like street magazines that cover street art. Well, exactly, yeah. Art. I have and a then, section for it. Totally, yeah. yeah. And then there's like Juxtapose, which right. will cover street art. But the problem I have with um, you know, publications like uh, Juxtapose or some of the bigger art magazines is oftentimes when they cover street art, it's really, they only do sort of the big names. Uh, and a big part of Up 2 and one of the things we try and promote is, you know, Up in the name, it's about getting up and it's also about people who are up and coming. And we really try and, you know, shine a light on artists that are still building their career mm -hmm. as opposed to just doing people who are already established. Um, you know, not that there's any disrespect to those that kind of have established themselves, but, uh, you know, with like respect to like Tristan Eaton, he doesn't need any more press. Mm -hmm. You know, he's already been written up a million times, but there's other artists that are still building a name for themselves that, you know, we want to be able to shine a light on. Right, right, no, definitely. And I want to kind of break down that multifaceted part now. So street art's come a long way mm -hmm. since the 1970s of tagging names to walls and putting works of art on subway trains in New York City, right? Mm -hmm. So is it fair to say all street art is public, whether or not it's permission or not. Because mm -hmm. some of it's not permission. Yeah. Right? So is it fair to say that all street art is public? Well, that's a good question. I think this is kind of one of the internal debates that happens a lot in the street art community is essentially what is street art, right? Because there's a lot of blurred boundaries, you know, between public art, between graffiti, between street art. There are some street artists that believe it's only really street art if it's illegal. They don't think commissioned mm. stuff counts. Um, or, you know, they don't feel like murals count, which I don't necessarily agree with. Mm -hmm. um, for me, and kind of how we've defined it with up, <coughs> is uh, street art is sort of the term we use, but it's sort of an all-encompassing umbrella term that refers to, you know, wheat paste, 
you know, throwies, uh, you know, tags, mm -hmm. murals, anything that is, you know, artistic creation that is put out in the public, whether sanctioned or unsanctioned. Um, but um, I'm not sure if that answered the question. Exactly. Yeah, no, you're, yeah. you're going in the right direction because I'm, I'm gonna get into that yeah. a little bit. But let's let's take form one. Let's take uh, letter writing, right? Letter writing sure. kind of you know got going in the '70s, but it's it's still as big as ever. Oh, right? totally. Yeah, right? it's just not on trains, right? Oh yeah, and, and it's global, so not concentrated. Well, in New every York. city in the oh, world's got right, right, craft. right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So not just trains or New York. Mm -hmm. It's it's everywhere, right? So. Um, and, and, and getting up is up magazine, right? No, so you, yeah. you, 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 you did it on the head. So would you say most of this letter writing is not permission? So because it's everywhere. So oftentimes, yeah, um, the way I personally see and define graffiti is sort of illegal uh, work that is based around lettering and characters, you know? Street art could be more portraiture or more broader images, but graffiti, I feel like, is really focused around characters and lettering. Uh, and oftentimes, that is illegal. Um, you know, it's kind of one of those funny things, right? If a graffiti writer who gets up illegally then gets given a wall and does a wall in their style, is that not graffiti because of the fact that now that it's been sanctioned? It's, uh, it's one of those things that, you know, the harder you try and define something the more that you see, you know, all definitions are a little fuzzy. Because, um, <laughs> well, I mean, if, yeah. you're, if you're doing letter writing on a freight train, right? Uh -huh. are, you going, are people going to call that street art, per se? It could be, but me, myself, I see that more as a style writing, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. You know, style writing, which is more of a term for that. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. And, and, you know, street art is a little more broader. But... Street, this, this tag writing, the name writing, mm -hmm. is on a lot of surfaces, right? Oh, totally, yeah. Freight trains, buildings, windows. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's everywhere. And, and generally, it, a lot of it's uh, illegal. Oh, totally. But you cover it, you know? Oh, yeah. We, uh, we cover graph. We, uh, we make it a point to uh, pay homage because, uh, you know, without graffiti, there wouldn't be street art. Uh, and that's, that's the reality of it. You know, if you... So one of the things that actually... Um, one of my very first street art articles... I was writing an article um, on the Biggie Smalls mural in Bed-Stuy. I think it's on Bedford and Quincy. And I was uh, writing an article basically about how, why was Biggie a character that so many people were painting? Uh, and in the course of writing this article, I ended up meeting uh, Will Power mm -hmm. of uh, the X-Vandals. And uh, I gotta give Will a shout out because really solid dude, really, really down to earth guy, but you know, he was kind of took me under his wing a little bit in the beginning and was giving me some advice. And he was like, yo, if you want to write about this, you got to know the history. And I think that's uh, a major part of it. And so I know some graffiti writers feel a way about street art because street art tends to get a little bit more um, public reception. It tends to get a little bit more praise. It's a little bit more middle class, you know, versus graffiti is a much more insular community. You know what I mean? I feel like with graffiti, a lot of writers, because graffiti artists call themselves graffiti writers, you know. Right. Um, you know, a lot of the writers, you know, they, they're they not doing it for the broader public. They're doing it for themselves and their community. Right, in their and, community. Right, exactly. right, right. And there, there is an overlap between the graffiti community <coughs> and the street art community, but they are their own distinct subcultures. Uh, I think of graffiti and street art in ways as like cousins. They're not as close as siblings. I think that's a good word. Yeah, yeah, because it's <coughs> they're related, but they are their own distinct realms. Yeah, because you know, and I, I'm really, like a lot of times, you know, the the letter writing is they're using alias, aliases, right? Mm -hmm. So you don't know their real names. Totally, yeah. So, so what do you think about that? Just at the beginning of like getting introduced to this art form, who is this guy? Yeah, you know, like he's using. You see his name but you don't really know who he is, Yeah. Right? Well, I always found that kind of interesting. Um, you know, uh, T.K. Mills is actually a pen name. Uh, and oh, it's, uh, I don't know your real name. <laughs> yeah, I know, okay. right? I don't, I don't spread my government out there too much, but... Um, Thanks for the secret. <laughs> yeah, right? Um, but yeah, so, um, you know, I think it's interesting because as someone who has always been a big reader, 
And, you know, that's part of what got me into writing. Uh, the idea of basically taking an alias is really common throughout history with writers, uh, either because fear <coughs> of repercussion or a way of creating an identity. You know, in contemporary times, it's more about building a brand. But, you know, with people taking on a separate name, I've always found that really interesting. You know, for myself, I took on uh, a pen name mostly because at the time, uh, I was still, I wasn't fully committed but until things really took off and I didn't want to burn a bridges if I did continue in politics or something of that nature. Um, plus it was kind of a, a way for me to like redefine myself and, and create a new identity for myself, which uh, I think is a common trait amongst, you know, both street artists and graffiti writers. Uh, taking on a name, it's a way to build a new identity for yourself. Mm -hmm. um, and I've always found that interesting. You know, most graffiti writers tend to pick names that are between three to five letters so you can get it up quick. Mm -hmm. You know, if you've got a, a super long name, it's gonna be hard to get that out, you mm -hmm. know, while you're doing some illegal spots. Um, but I always thought the idea of like, yeah, taking on, you know, an art name uh, is a really interesting concept and something I think a lot about. Um, and the way is that, you know, it like lets people kind of build and define their art around that as opposed to whoever they were born as. Right, right, no, that's, that's great way to answer that, that question. And so also, the letter writing has found this, you know, obviously they still have the black books, right? Mm -hmm. But it's also found its way on the canvases. Mm -hmm. So artists are taking some of the stuff they're doing on the streets, mm -hmm. putting it on canvases and making money, using their notoriety to, to do something legal with it. Mm -hmm. and make and make money so uh are you getting a lot of that or you still think a lot of the, the, the tagging is not about going towards a business it's more like being in the in your clique or being in your community which i know is big yeah so i think it's uh like anything it really comes down to the artist i mean i feel like in my experience most of the graffiti writers i've known they really do it for themselves and that's why they get up but at the same time, everyone's got to eat. And you know, if your your passion is your art, uh, putting your tag on a canvas and someone buys it, like, you know, more respect to you. Everyone's got to find a way to, you know, stay alive, pay rent, put food on the table. And I feel like, you know, if you can find a way to monetize your passion and so you can continue to do your passion and it becomes self-sustaining, more power to you. Um, I know some people who you know, do tags and bombs and throwies, you know, they, they stay away from canvases because they see it as sort of going against what graffiti is really about. But I feel like, in my opinion, and I'm not a graph writer, so, you know, it's kind of an outsider opinion, it's really, it's like, whatever works, you know what I mean? Um, actually, in our third issue, uh, Community, we did an article about memorial murals. And so, when New York really started to crack down on train writing, a lot of graffiti writers started turning to walls. And with walls, a lot of people on the idea of trying to monetize uh, started doing memorials, some of which was you know, done as sort of a, a public service, but some of it was commissioned, you know? So-and-so would be, you know, killed and their family wanted to pay tribute. They would hire a graffiti writer to come in, paint their portrait on their wall, mm -hmm. you know? And so there's different ways to kind of build on that while staying true to the ethos of it. Of it, right, right. And then they also have um, different styles. Are you good at, say, if you saw a piece, that's Miami style, or that's the style in, in, in uh, Germany, or whatever. There's, there's all these different oh, styles. Oh, totally, yeah. Are you able to, to navigate that? So uh, there is some things that now that I'm familiar enough with the scene, I can <laughs> recognize most artists on site and be able to tell you where they're from. Um, wow. But this is actually something I've talked with uh, a lot of both artists and graph writers um, where style used to be very localized. You know, um, people, a lot of people get into graffiti kind of comes through a mentor sort of form where mm -hmm. it was always like, you know, you had an uncle or like a friend's older brother that kind of showed you what was up and that was how you got into it. And that was how you learned and that's how kind of styles got localized because you were always learning from people in the community. Um, with the internet, I think that's kind of shifted a bit. Now, you know, you can learn techniques from anyone from anywhere. Uh, and so I feel like some of those, you know, regional differences are not as delineated as they once blurred. were. It's getting blurred, It's getting blurred. But there are people that, you know, do things in a certain distinctive way. I feel like, you know, if you look at like New York Graph, 
Um, there's a lot of people who go real heavy with the lettering uh, with like chrome and black, you know, versus I know in LA, I've seen a lot of people that work with like red paint. Uh, and th that might just be, you know, something I've noticed through my own personal observations. I don't know how accurate that is. Um, but yeah, I've, I've learned that um, while there was a lot of distinctions, and they are, still are, uh, with the internet, it's with everything that the internet has done, uh, it's made things a little less defined. Well, I think it's interesting, like when I see the LA style lettering, the mm -hmm. Hispanic kind of lettering, that's so distinct mm -hmm. that you kind of have an idea that that comes from the Latin yeah. culture, right? Yeah. Versus bubble letters is everywhere. Oh yeah. But yeah. that that L.A. style with the Latin lettering is that's you, distinct. Yeah, like the little flares people put on stuff too. Yeah. You know. Yeah, right. The flares as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, so I'm gonna. I know we're talking about street art, but I want to use it maybe in this this context because I'm. Uh, I broke this up into letter writing, street art, kind of like as a global form, yeah. and then I'll make murals last. Okay. All right. So, so street art as, a, as this global form is very expensive. Mm. From from wheat, wheat pasting, wheat pasting could be really magnificent art. Mm -hmm. Just that they, they put it on paper, posters, yeah. and they you know they put it on walls. Mm -hmm. So so that's that's real. Uh, expansive in, in terms of using using the art form mm. in that kind of way. Now, wheat pasting is. Would you say that's most of it's non-permission or or some of it's permission? I haven't really seen a lot of people talk about wheat pasting as permission. Yeah. So uh, with wheat paste, and and this is speaking mostly on the New York community, a lot of it is uh, illegal. Um, but it's sort of an, there's an interesting thing. Um, I was actually having a discussion with a, a local New York artist, Sack Six, who was a big wheat paster about this because, um, you know, you go around the city, you see on all the construction sites, not only is there art, there's also a lot of wheat pasted ads, <laughs> uh, which are also illegal. Um, but it's very rare for the city to come down on it's advertisers yeah. Yeah. versus sometimes they'll come down hard on artists. So with wheat paste, it does tend to be illegal. I mean, there's some people who do it legally, but usually... A, a big part of the appeal with wheat paste is you can do a complex design, print it out, and then it takes, you know, 30 seconds to glue it up. Uh, so it's a way to kind of get your message out quickly versus when something is legal, you typically have more time to work on it. And so I feel like that kind of lends itself to muralism because you can really build and develop it more. Right, um, right. You have more time exactly. to, to do it. Exactly. And in some cases, we'll get into it, they're getting paid to do it. Exactly. Right? Yeah. So, but uh, that's interesting because you could spend a lot of time mm. making an art piece, and wheat pasting is pretty easy to put up. You just got to find the spot. Exactly. So yeah. that's, that's very uh, dynamic. That, in that space, and are there, Sac 6 is pretty prolific, but are there other artists that's in that space that you can kind of mention, and whether you guys are going to do maybe a wheat pasting issue, which would be quite interesting. Yeah, so I don't know if we'll do a wheat pasting issue, though there is an issue I think we're planning uh, called, you know, the, the focus would be about the craft, and it would really look at the different forms and mediums of street art, uh, and wheat pasting obviously being one of them. Um, another wheat paster I would shout out, uh, I think she's the queen of New York City wheat paste, is Phoebe New York. Okay. She gets up everywhere, even before I was really in the street art scene, I was seeing Phoebe's, and she does... She has sort of a small character, and her wheat paste tend to be smaller, but she gets up on telephone poles, she gets up on mailboxes, she gets up everywhere. I think I've seen her work in basically every city, uh, or every borough, um, except maybe Stan, but Stan's always its own thing. Uh, but she gets up like crazy. Um, I know another wheat paster I'll give a shout out to, uh, he's not as active as he used to be, but Kafka. Uh, Kafka was someone that I used to see a lot. Um, you know, another one, Fireflower is uh, one of my favorite artists and a friend mm -hmm. who's a very talented wheat paster. Um, but I find wheat pasters, oftentimes when people are kind of getting into street art, you know, kind of the, uh, the gateway drug is stickers. Because stickers are... I was going to ask you about yeah. stickers, yeah. Stickers are very easy to produce, very easy to get up, very, uh, you can do it subtly, you know, there's not as much of a threat or a risk of getting caught. You know, a lot of times then people evolve from stickers to wheat paste. 
because uh, again, you can have time to develop it before you actually go out and put it on the street. Uh, and then, you know, after that is, you know, throwies, yeah, throwies bombing, murals, and working mm -hmm. with spray cans. Mm -hmm. So the stickers are pretty hard to follow. I mean, me, myself. I mean, I there's can never, a million I, stickers. Yeah. yeah, there's so many sticker artists. Yeah. I, I, can't, I can't follow sticker art. That's just, it's too complicated, man. Oh, yeah. But also, in, in street art, we, we see the explosion of artists who are getting up in the streets, but now they're making money. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you got the Baskies or Mr. Brainwash, mm -hmm. right? And they, they, they come from that community. Mm -hmm. And now it's like big, big business. And so how do you see, it's not wrong with um, some of these artists making big money. It's great, you know, but there's so many artists that's not. Mm -hmm. So is there like a divide in terms of, or, or it's just pure competition? So Michael Jordan's in basketball, <laughs> he's a star, yeah. and whereas like a Mr. Brainwash was a star, or some, something on, on that caliber. So um, there is a certain level of competition. I mean, I feel like a lot of art is a certain level of ego, and with ego there is that sort of competitive element. But I don't think, I think most artists within the street art realm uh, are very supportive. There's a really strong community. People are always trying to teach each other, work together. So I don't think there's necessarily a competition aspect in that regard. Um, but in terms of the divide between those that are making it and those that are still working how to, f you know, essentially make it work financially, um, a lot of it comes down to hustle, you know, uh, and a lot of it comes down to who you know. Um, there are artists that are incredibly talented that never profit financially just because they don't have that sort of business smarts. Uh, and then there are other artists that I think are maybe not the most talented technically, but they just have something that connects with an audience and they can sell really well. Um, I'll actually say, so, um, you know, there's an artist, Hectad, who's uh, very famous for his hearts. Um, and I remember I was sitting down with him once. And, uh, you know, there are people... I mean, like any community, you know, people talk shit. And there are people I've heard talk shit on Hectad because he does hearts. Uh, but he also can do a lot of graph. I mean, he's been in the game like, you know, 20, 30 years. I think he got started in the 80s. And so, you know, I remember talking to him once like, well, why hearts? You know, you can do all this stuff, why hearts? And he's like, well, that's what people like. That's what people gravitate to. That's what connects. And, you know, again, I, nothing but respect for people who find a way to make it work. You know, I feel like, that is a pressure that happens in any creative industry is when you find something that's very saleable, how do you continue to kind of express yourself creatively when, you know, your audience kind of expects a certain style. There's a, <coughs> sorry, there's a, a financial pressure to kind of continue to do that, yeah, yeah. you know, and like how do you continue to grow your work in a creative means that continues to also be, you know, uh, financially stable. And I think there's no right or wrong answer. Um, and to any artist that's trying to kind of find that, I would say just explore, you know, and kind of keep a mind on both sides. Like you have to stay creative, but also, you know, if you want to make it your full-time thing, you also have to think business-wise, you know? Right. Whether that's working in branding, uh, whether you're using your artistic talents to do design, there's different avenues to explore, and I think it's one of those, you know, there's no one-size-fits-all. It's kind of like you just got to find what works for you. Right, right. Yeah, I have to kind of personalize it. Yeah, well, like, even with Up, um, you know, with, uh, with Up, uh, we don't really make money on the journalism aspect, but to me, the journalism aspect is kind of my own form of expression and the way my team, you know, expresses themselves. And so we want to keep the journalism strong and want to keep the integrity behind it, you know, and the way that we kind of found that we can kind of work financially without sort of compromising that uh, was kind of through partnerships. Because uh, there are a lot of other magazines that uh, basically just become content mills for people that pay for blog spots, you know, mm -hmm. and that's something we never wanted to happen mm -hmm. without. You want to be critical. Exactly, yeah. Crit especially for the art. Because a lot of good art and, and have someone to really well, write about. Well, not critical, but like... Yeah. Uh, looking at it through a critical lens. Okay. Because one of the philosophies of Up is uh, we never punch down, you only punch up. You know, like you don't want to shit on someone who's just starting out and still finding their footing, mm -hmm. you know, but we're not afraid to kind of uh, critique someone who's a big name 
you know, and kind of made it. And it's just kind of a philosophy of, uh, yeah, like, you know, once you kind of get bigger that certain aspects of your life and certain aspects of your art, I feel like it, uh, you know, warrants a little bit more thought versus someone that's getting started, they're still finding their footing, mm -hmm. you know, so mm -hmm. it's uh, staying true to that. So I, just from my personal standpoint, mm -hmm. I'm always having just difficulty understanding the artist Baski, right? It's like, you know, he's got stuff on walls and, and it's wheat pasting and it's so valuable, but it's, it's even hard for me to believe he's real, but he is in, in a sense. So how do you see this guy, Baski, as this global phenomenon from London? Yeah, so with, uh, with Banksy, it's interesting because of the fact that I feel like he is one of, he's one of a kind. He's the artist that made street art mainstream. You know, he broke onto the other side. And I think uh, I've watched the doc a few documentaries on him. Um, you know, that are really interesting. Obviously, Exit Through the Gift Shop is, I think, a masterpiece of cinema um, in many regards. But it's a, it's a very interesting take on both street art because it, ostensibly it was started by Mr. Brainwash filming Banksy. And then as Banksy kind of started working with him, like this guy's a little bit of a loon, he kind of <laughs> takes the camera and shifts it and looks at, you know, uh, Mr. Brainwash as someone who wasn't really an artist in the traditional sense but thanks to sort of the network he was in, was able to become very successful. And it's kind of like, you know, this artist who isn't really technically talented is now selling well. And so it's kind of like, well, what does that actually mean of the art? Right. And I think Banksy is very clever with uh, what he does. You know, like there was the, uh, the time he came to New York and uh, he hired someone to sell original pieces of his work that are probably worth thousands if not millions at this point and people were buying them for like 10 20 bucks you know because it just looked like some knockoff right yeah uh, and i thought that was a really clever uh clever way of kind of critiquing the entire financial institution around street art um but yeah i mean banksy is is the one of the biggest artists in the world today that's still alive um you know he works a lot with pest control which is basically his company uh, and, um, you know, I, he has a team that he works with, and this is common for a lot of artists that I think when they hit it big, they kind of build a team around them because it's hard to do everything yourself. Um, yeah, Shepard Ferry is like that too, right? Exactly, yeah. Well, I, I will say with Shepard Ferry, one thing that gives me a lot of respect for Shepard is although he's got a team, I know he's always out painting his own stuff as well. Like, I remember a couple years back, I was in Denver, and he was there for, um, uh, crush Walls. It was a mural festival out there in Denver. And, uh, you know, we had a team. He was doing a, like a, probably like a six-story building. And he had a team that was helping him, but he was up there on the lift too. He was painting as well. And it's funny, I always think of um, Shepard Ferry and Banksy as almost like the Superman Batman of street art because, um, you know, they're the two biggest names. They're the two of the biggest icons of the scene. And, you know, Shepard Ferry is very outspoken. You know, he's publicly out, his face is out there, his name. Um, you know, he came a long way from the Obey stickers. But he also uses his art to do a lot of good. Like, he does a lot of activism. You know, he does a lot of charity events. Uh, and he kind of, you know, puts himself out there. Versus Banksy, kind of in the Batman light, is, you know, very much in the shadows. You know, yeah, yeah. a Banksy will just go up one day and all of a sudden it's like, oh, wow, now this wall is like something super special that's kind of out there. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it's interesting. I feel like uh, he's, um, <laughs> you know, the, the differences between the two, and I don't know if they're familiar with one another. I've never met either personally, <laughs> at least not yet. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. But I think it's really interesting, you know, in the different ways and approaches that they take to the medium. Yeah, yeah, they're totally different styles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Totally different styles, but uh, really that, that market is just growing and growing and growing. Totally, yeah. So I think the next generation coming up is mm -hmm. going to be a great opportunity for them, you know? And so hundred uh, it's going to be good for young artists coming up. So let's, let's get into Muriel art because this, this is what this show is. It's a mm. photograph. Of, it's the Jersey City Festival. It's a Muriel Festival, yep. right. And so and this, I, I want to maybe concentrate more on the permission side because mm -hmm. the permission side it's, it's, it's a money side, right? Yeah. And they're, they're hiring these artists 
to paint large-scale mm. murals, right? And so that's the business side. So you have that street art where the celebrities mm. in street art, Baskies and, and Shepherd Fairies, they make money. But there's a whole growing movement that I'm mm. seeing as a photographer, like these names are incredible. Mm. And the, the types of walls they are painting is just so, so, so incredible. So what, how do you see in terms of Up Magazine and this mural art mm. movement? Because you, you actually re represent a company that's doing commercial murals as well, right? Uh, yeah, so we, so um, it's interesting because, uh, you know, with like Mural Painter Inc., the, one of our partners, they do commercial murals, uh, which are basically hand-painted advertisements, um, okay. which is a little bit different, I think, than, you know, sanctioned walls, but it, this is still creative art. You know what I mean? Right. Uh, so there's a little bit of a difference there. But um, yeah, it's one of those that as the scene grows and as the community grows, the opportunities grow with it. And um, there are a lot of ways, I think, for artists that can kind of build on it. You know, there are artists who get commissioned to paint walls uh, or artists that build a name for themselves on their walls and then sell their canvases. Mm. Um, but I think that there, there's a lot of opportunities. And with you know, muralism as sort of a, a subsect of street art, it's arguably the most popular form because it's the most out there. And I feel like street art is very approachable. Uh, I honestly think one of the biggest reasons that muralism has grown so much has been thanks to social media like Instagram. And um, all social media is sort of a double-edged sword, you know, with all the, the shit that comes with it. Um, but with you know, Instagram, it allowed people to reach a wider audience, mm -hmm. you know, art that is sort of beautiful is obviously very picturesque. Right. A lot of people take selfies or photos of art and it creates a, a different level of public engagement where people kind of can connect to the art and connect to the artist and like have a relationship with walls, you know? I mean, there are walls that I've walked by that are murals um, and I'll walk by and it's, always really interesting and then I'm always like disappointed if like you know it gets painted over or something happens you know you, you build a connection mm -hmm. to murals and it's funny even like you know I've lived in Bushwick for a while and it's like there are certain spots and certain murals that like I they, I almost know them better than the street names and like those are my landmarks you know I'm like oh okay that one's near the Menace and Reza oh that that pizza shop's over by down by you know yeah. whoever you know what yeah, I mean yeah 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 no there's a, there's a there's a, a, a growing movement that I see among these young artists who, who may be tagging their names, mm -hmm. but they want to grow mm -hmm. to be, be Muriel artists, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, Crash came out of the subway era, mm -hmm. and now he's a gigantic, like, Muriel artist. Oh, yeah, Crash you know, is a, a big is, name, yeah. Yeah, it's amazing. So you, you've traveled, and you, you've seen these Muriel festivals, and so how do you see that in terms of, you know, this, this community and, and maybe Up Magazine participating in that, maybe they're hosting a festival or how, how do you see Up positioning himself in the Muriel Festival? Because you was in, I saw you down in Miami, yes. right? And you was yeah. in Mexico, right? Mm -hmm. So what, what do you see as, as far as the Muriel art movement and where Up Magazine could so, fit in? Yeah, with, um, I mean, with Up, we try and cover everything that's in the street art realm. Um, and obviously Mural Festivals are a major part of that. Uh, we were down in Miami Art Basel for the past three years. Uh, well, we didn't go for the 2020, but I don't think that anything even happened that year because of COVID. But we were down this past December, uh, and that was really interesting. We interviewed a lot of artists, got to make a lot of connections. You know, you were there as well. I was there, absolutely. Yeah. Um, this uh, last month in February, I was down in Akamal Arts Festival. Uh, and I, it was funny because I was there sort of on... Two levels. One hand, I've been to every edition of the Akamal Arts Festival, all four, uh, and it's been really cool to see the festival grow and really, it's really community oriented. It's really been able, it, it's been exciting to see how it's kind of benefited the local Mexican community. Um, but I was also there, uh, my girlfriend, Vanessa Kratek, was uh, one of the artists on the roster, and so she was actually painting there, uh, and that was really cool to kind of be there and watch her mural career develop. And I actually helped her a little bit uh, with some of the buffing and prepping the wall oh, and everything. Oh, you got out of there and painted yeah, too. Yeah, yeah. That's cool. Um, yeah, no, I, I, I've i done different artistic projects, <laughs> but I'm not confident enough in my own artistic ability to ever do anything under my own name. Oh, you, okay. Um, right. I stick yeah. to writing for yeah. that. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Right. Um, 
But yeah, no, uh, working with the, um, like, Akamal is really cool. Um, you know, they, there's a lot of synergies that kind of happen there. Um, and with Akamal, it's interesting because they have artists from all around the world fly in. Uh, people from, you know, England, Manchester, London. Wow. They have people from New York. They have artists from Chicago, artists from Miami. And it's really cool with the festival because it's this kind of cross-pollination where artists get to meet and mingle and learn from each other and just hang out. Um, and with like Akamal, I kind of like it better because it's a little bit more small scale. Miami Art Basel is uh, honestly kind of a clusterfuck. It's a bit overwhelming. And it's like there's so many murals you almost can't keep up with it versus Akamal is like a little bit more contained. It's still expansive. It's still incredible. But it's, it's like a little bit more personable versus Miami is just like one giant party. You know? Yeah, so down in Mexico, do they each year paint over the same walls, or is there new walls? So, interesting enough, the way that the Akamal Arts Festival started was uh, initially uh, Jen Smith, who's the director of the Akamal Arts Festival, she's been a long-time resident, she's been there 20-something years. Um, she originally moved to Mexico because it was where she had gone for like her honeymoon. And she was uh, a local business owner, she opened up a cafe, the Turtle Bay Cafe, which is kind of like a local diner. Mm -hmm. um, and she was meeting with the uh, Akamal Delgado, which is kind of like their equivalent of like a mayor, essentially. Okay. And was talking to him about having lights installed um, because a lot of the women that worked in her cafe uh, were coming from, basically Akamal is split. There's the Pueblo, which is uh, a little further inland, and then there's the beachfront, the playa. Um, and so a lot of her workers um, were coming from the Pueblo to the playa, and there's a, a walking bridge, but at night it was kind of dark, and you know, she wanted to have lights installed so that her workers felt safer just coming back and forth. And uh, that was how the Akamal Arts Festival started, because when she started talking about the Delgado, they were talking about different public projects they could do that could kind of build things up. And they brought in the, they came up with the idea of bringing in artists as a way to kind of bring a little bit of attention to the town um, and kind of, you know, start to generate tourism outside of the turtles and the, um, you know, the beachfront. And so a lot of the focus was on the Pueblo because, um, not to get too deep into the contextual history, but basically Akamal is on the Mayan Riviera. Uh, there's a couple cities along. There's Cancun at the top. Playa del Carmen, and then Akamal, and then Tulum. And Akamal was kind of a small town along the way that, you know, their only really major source of tourism revenue was, uh, that's where Turtles Nest, which is uh, where the name Akamal comes from. I believe it's Mayan for turtle. And so... Uh, so there's a lot of turtles in that town. There's a lot of turtles, yeah. And it's <laughs> funny because there's a lot of turtle murals now, too. Oh, um, okay, cool. But, um, yeah, with Akamal, it's been really cool to have gone back there for the past four years and really see it develop. And they've really invested a lot of what they do into building the town. Like there's a park in the center of town that when I first got there was like kind of run down, like a little, you know, like a little like sketchy. And um, they've really built it up where now they've got a whole new playground. They've got, you know, these nicely painted bleachers for people to come. They've got a nice like, uh, you know, basketball court. And they've really built it up for the people that live there. And that was actually uh, one of the articles in the Travel in Place issue was about Akamal. And that was kind of, to me, Akamal is an example of beautification rather than gentrification. Because gentrification tends to have certain exploitative connotations mm -hmm. versus beautification is more you're literally beautifying a town with art. And through that, you know, it creates uh, a more dynamic and positive presence that I feel like has a sort of energy that grows if you know what I mean. No, no, it's great. And um, is it funded by the, by so, the city? Or? No, so it's, um, it's basically, it's a nonprofit. Um, they don't really make any money from it. They just try and basically bring in sponsors to cover the cost of paint. They work a lot with local <laughs> residents to host artists. Um, actually, one of our partners, Third Rail, is uh, one of the sponsors for the Akamal Arts Festival. Um, this year, they also had Ublo which is um, like a watch company, helped bring in, uh, put some money down, and they helped fund it. Um, they did like a whole campaign where they had like a Mayan-inspired watch, and they had a local artist do like the watch design and do a mural and tie it in with it. Um, but yeah, I would definitely look to Akamal as like an example of like the best of what an art festival can be. 
Yeah, I mean, it's, it's great. So they're, they're, they're paying for artists' flight, though, right? So, there's, there's funding for the artists. So, no. So the, the kind of shtick with uh, Akamal is um, artists have to fund their own flight, but all of your lodging and all of your food is taken care of and all of your paint. Okay. Which is pretty major cost. It's not and, a bad deal. And yeah, yeah, and honestly, it's worth it because it's you know it's whatever. I think my flight this year was like three hundred bucks round trip, and then it's like you're basically staying for free for like a week. Oh, you know? okay. So it, it's definitely worth it. It's worth um, it. Okay. And it's just always really good energy too. Yeah, I know Jersey City. I believe ninety five percent of the seventy five artists get paid. Oh, that's cool. That. Yeah. That well, that's a big <laughs> thing too. I think in the community, it's like. You know, with painting murals, it's like, what are you doing it for? And this isn't a begrudging artist that's getting paid, because honestly, getting paid is a big part of it. But with, like, Akamal, the focus really is on the community, and it's kind of like the reason people come in is to, like, have that interaction. Because, you know, there's some festivals where you come in, you paint, you never see anyone that actually lives there. You kind of just do your thing and go. Versus go, right. in Akamal, you know, you're literally painting on like people's houses. You get to know them, you get to like oh, hang out. Oh, it's a social. Element. Yeah, yeah, and so they really kind of lean into the community aspect. No, that's, that's beautiful. And uh, so we just went through three different categories of street art and that's how yeah. complex it is, right? So it's, just, uh, it's great to, to get, you know, in depth into this, this movement and to kind of see it grow. But since, since I'm a photographer, Mm -hmm. How do you see photography playing a role in this movement? I know in the 70s, photography documented it, and the only reason they know about these subway cars is because oh, they totally, were yeah. well, So how do you see it today? So street art is by nature ephemeral. You know what I mean? You paint a wall, but whether it gets painted over, whether that wall gets destroyed, or whether it just gets wrecked by you know rain and bad weather, uh, it's ephemeral, you know, most murals don't last forever, uh, especially true of like wheat paste and other forms of street art. So I feel like the, the role of the documentarian in the street art community is really important. I mean, a big part of how street art and graffiti went global was through actually the photographers. Um, so Martha Cooper and Henry Chalfant put together this book, Subway Art, right. um, that I love. It's, it's like a classic. Uh, I forget the exact year, but it was basically documenting all of the art on the subways, and you know, they had all the big names back in the day, like Don D and whoever, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and um, they put out the book, and what was funny is actually, the book got, you know, in the United States, like it kind of flopped, like it didn't really sell well, and they thought it was a, a failure, and then copies ended up getting, you know, basically smuggled into Europe and South America, and you know, artists in these other countries, it was their first exposure because this was before the internet, so you mm -hmm, didn't mm -hmm. see it unless you saw it. Right. And so um, it really opened up this world of possibilities to artists in all these other nations. You know, I remember, I think it was in the Martha Cooper documentary where uh, Os Gimos, who are two really big uh, artists from, I believe, Brazil, uh, talked about um, how reading subway art was a major influence on them. Like, oh wow, like there's a lot you can do with this and there's a lot you can do with spray paint. So I feel like photographers play a really essential role in helping to, you know, document as well mm -hmm. as build the community. And in the age of social media, it really helps artists grow because it's, you know, people taking photographs of your work and tagging you that you can build a following in. Mm -hmm, Once mm -hmm. you have that following, you can start to build a business around it. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. I feel photographers, uh, yeah, they, they play an essential part. I mean, even in Up, you know, when we started, we were really a, a writer's magazine. Most of three fourths of the initial group of Up were writers, not photographers. And one of the things we learned is that, you know, you could write about art, but to really fully capture it, obviously you need good photos. And so one of the things we've done with each issue of the magazine is to try and build more and more photo galleries into it, as you yourself yeah, have yeah, I'm contributed. Yeah, yeah, I'm getting, I'm getting, I'm, I'm contributing. Yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So uh, it's a pleasure to yeah, do yeah, that, yeah, yeah. you know. But no, I mean, me as a photographer, I'm, 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 in, I'm in the space and, you know, there's a lot of legal stuff going on now with, you know, artists and photographers and how photographers use the photos of the art. Yeah. I'm, I'm always spending a lot of time on it, but I'm running into that. You no, know, no, totally. And I feel like it's one of those things, right, where it's hard when your creative medium is based around someone else's medium. You know what I mean? Like, 
but I feel like as a photographer, you bring in your own creative element, right? Whether that's through angles or through like what you choose to capture and how you focus, that's a, a major part of it, you know? Cause it's, it's one of those things like, okay, you just take a photo of a wall, sure. But like taking a photo with certain lighting or certain angles that creates that own creative element, yeah, oh, sure, you know? Sure, sure, um, sure. And it's the same with writing as well, you know? We're uh, an art magazine, we do art journalism, we write about artists. Um, and so it's kind of like, you know, we're building off of what someone else is doing, but we kind of bring our own element into it that makes an article in art in itself, mm -hmm. you know? And with, uh, with Up, you know, it's a magazine, but really it's a book. I mean, all of the issues are basically meant to be read cover to cover. Because the way we, we curate it very heavily from, you know, beginning to end, mm -hmm. including even just like the article order, we try and put a flow to it, you okay. know? Right. So it, it, there's different ways of kind of making something that is not inherently creative, uh, creative and aesthetic, you know? No, it's, it's uh, interesting because, you know, I always think like, okay, if it's, if it's on the street and it's in the public, how do you police photographs? Okay. I mean, I mean, you don't obviously, you know, people are not making pictures and putting it on t shirt but they could. Yeah. But let's say, if you are an artist and you put it out there, you're just, you know, you're putting yourself in the public. So people are gonna take pictures of it. Oh, totally. You, you're not gonna control everybody, but you know, it's a new legal thing where artists are saying, okay, how do we protect this? But you're in the public and it's really mm. hard for me to see like, how do you do it? I mean, I, I do collaborations with, with companies uh -huh. that are putting public art out, yeah. and giving me access to photograph it, you know, and that, that way I'm safe. Yeah. But to me, it's like, okay, I'm not gonna go too far. So I'm not gonna photograph tagging, right? Yeah. Because it's, it's too wild. I don't want any Well, well I feel like also taggers is kind of a different aspect where like they're not trying to get those photographs, you know what I mean? Oh, okay. But I, but I feel like with, um, you know, kind of like you touched on that with sort of some of the legal aspects. I mean, I feel like a lot of it is just communication. Like even artists, when we feature their photos in our issues, you know, we always give them a heads up. I mean, a lot of the artists that we work with are some of my close friends at this point. And it's, it's really, I feel like the difference is just being like, hey, you cool with this? Like communicating and, and having kind of that communal aspect yeah, yeah. is what makes it different. I feel like the reason people are, at least a lot of artists are concerned with some of that legal aspects is because you have some, you know, big companies like, I think it was, um, I don't want to get hit with slander for naming the wrong company, <laughs> but there, there are companies out there that will film like basically an advertisement, like a full million dollar campaign advertisement where they feature murals as a prominent part of right. the campaign. Yeah, yeah. And not only do they not pay the artist, they also don't give credit. And that's kind of exploitative, you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, yeah. Like, but there is, like you said, it's like you put something out there you can only have so much ego because once it's public and it's in the public domain, you don't have that control. You don't have the control, yeah. But I feel like the answer really is just, again, it's, it's community. And like I said before, it's about giving credit where credit's due, you know? If you can't financially provide, at least making sure that like you credit the artist. So mm -hmm. someone who's interested in that art can find them and then buy one of their t-shirts or right. buy one of their canvases or yeah, whatever, you yeah, know? Yeah, yeah. Like building on that. Okay, so, so photography really has a great role in this, in the art form. Oh, itself. totally, yeah. Yeah, all right, this is great. So do you want to say anything, well, any questions before yeah, I wrap please, it up? Yeah, please, if you guys. Okay. No well, question? I want to give a shout out to uh, the whole UpMag team. Although I am sort of the face and the editor in chief, you know, it, it really, Up wouldn't exist without all of our contributors. Uh, shout out to all the artists we've worked with. Um, and I don't know when this video is going up, but uh, we're looking at May for the release of our next issue, issue five, Icons, and uh, that one's going to be pretty exciting because it looks at the, uh, the way that um, art and iconography are interrelated. Um, but, uh, but yeah. Yeah, no, thank you, TK. It's been, it's been uh, great. And yeah. so I uh, appreciate it. Yeah, thanks, man. Well, thanks.